Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange, and today we're going to do something very interesting, a lot of fun. We're actually in St. Augustine, hanging out with my friend Sam Andrews of Andrews Custom Leather. Sam, good to see good you to again, Good to see you sir. as always. Yes. I see you survived the uh, zombie apocalypse. Absolutely. Part, I don't know, five, six. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> You know what? We we always do holsters and, right. we, and we do stuff like that, which we're going to do. But I thought this would be a great opportunity to show people some a couple of things from your collection. Right. There's been a lot of occasions where we've mentioned in the past yeah. that I collect the British Empire period arms. Right. But we've never really had a chance to go into them in detail. Yes. So. And so I'm always bragging to people about your awesome guns. And this is you guys' chance to see it right now. Let's get into this. All right. So first thing, Sam, I uh, I want to apologize to CN Arsenal <laughs> that I don't know anything. <laughs> These are awesome guns, but I'm not. I you know I'm, I'm just sure haven't been doing Othias this. I'm sure will forgive you. Yes. Yeah, my apologies, nice Othias. <laughs> don't don't hold it against me. But shout out to CN Arsenal <laughs> out there. So. Um, Tell us about what kind of guns you collect first before we start, right. well, before we get into this. The period of history I found most interesting is the British Empire period, which would be about from 1700s through about the end of World War II when the decolonialization was occurring in the 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. Okay. And so that's the era of the arms I've collected. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, this goes back to the Napoleonic Wars. Okay. Ooh. This one is an early 1800s light dragoons pistol. Mm -hmm. They were large caliber smooth bore, mm -hmm. single shot muzzle loader flintlock. There's a uh, funny story behind this one. I acquired it from a antique arms dealer in England named Andrew Bottomley. He is a big, big noise in the antique arms industry. Mm -hmm. He shipped it to me and the box I got contained a gear shift for a Toyota pickup truck, oh. <laughs> which I, on examination, decided was not, in fact, the flintlock I had ordered. Okay. He was using a shipping service at Birmingham Airport. They had two packages of approximately the same size, and they mixed up the waybills. My pistol ended up in Kuwait. Ooh. Well... The Kuwaitis would not return it because under their laws, a gun is a gun. Flint locker, machine gun, same thing. Mm -hmm. So he, to his great credit, sent me an even better model. This one is made by Durr's Egg, who is a well-known London gunsmith of that period. Very beautiful example. So this is from that time period, it's yes. not a reproduction. No, this would have been carried during the wars against Napoleon by British Light Dragoons, Light Cavalry. And they usually had a pair of them in saddle holsters, one on each side of the saddle. Okay. And how exactly would one go about loading these and firing them? With your typical flintlock, you put it to half cock, mm -hmm. place a little priming powder in the pan, close the frizzen so your powder doesn't fall out, mm -hmm. pour the rest of your charge in the barrel, place the ball, Ram it down, replace your ramrod, bring the hammer to full cock, mm -hmm. and then fire it. And the flint striking the frizzen will create the sparks which ignite the powder. Wow. I don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to go through that whole thing. So, so, so you said usually they'll have two of these, so you'll use right. one, put that away, exactly. use the other one. Exactly. Kind of Their holsters were like big buckets, and the oh, front okay. of your knees on each side of the yeah. saddle boat. So, that's you, cool. You're only getting one shot, and you're probably <laughs> not going to reload it on horseback. So yeah. That was what they used. Very nice. Then, when we came to the percussion era, mm -hmm. this was a uh, early Lancers pistol. Lancers rode with a long spear, but oh. they would they would have a sword and a pistol as well. Mm -hmm. And this 
of course used the percussion cap in place of the less reliable flint ignition. Mm -hmm. Same loading procedure, powder and ball down the barrel. This one has a captured ramrod on that hinge. So you don't really lose it. Right, so you can ram it mm -hmm. maybe on horseback mm -hmm. and then replace it. Okay. I'm sure it was an improvement. <laughs> yeah, so this is a slight tech upgrade. How many years forward is this? This would be about 30 or 40 years beyond the first model. Okay. Very cool. Yep. Yeah. When we get to the period when repeating arms are appearing, this is a, I believe the name is a Bentley revolver. Bentley. Bentley, okay. made by a British firm, mm -hmm. and it was the same era as Colt's early cap and balls, mm -hmm. the Pattersons and the early Dragoons. And this one was double action only. There's no spur to cock the hammer. It loaded in each cylinder. You put your loose powder and ball in there, and it had a loading ram here, a lever that would push the ball down in the top of oh, your cool. powder charge. Yeah. And then you would cap the nipples and carefully lower the hammer in between so you don't bump the thing okay. and set it off. But in the beginning, British officers had to acquire their own weapons. Enlisted men, everything was issued. But as an officer and a gentleman, you had to pony up quite a good deal of money for your kit. Swords, uniforms, pistols, saddles, it got expensive. So there were many different makers who provided guns for military officers. And was there, so was there a particular maker that was renowned that everyone in the, in the collecting world that everyone's looking for? Well, there are several makers that were big in that era. Mm -hmm. This is one, this is the Adams, and I actually have a card here, which mm -hmm. designates it's the 1872. This mm -hmm. is in the cartridge era. Mm -hmm. And like a Colt, it was a gate loader. So you would place the cartridges in the side of the gate there. It was a double or single action. And it had a ram that swiveled out from the side to punch out the empty cartridges. Okay. And then you would swivel it back inward and push the rod into the center. These were very, very popular with British officers. They were in a 45 Adams, which was rather an underpowered cartridge. The, the mm -hmm. early black powder revolver cartridges in England were not very stout. Okay. It has a long-looking cylinder, but the, the bullets were actually quite short. Okay, so the government was setting what calibers they had also, or was that like a... That didn't occur until later on when they standardized. Most of the people buying weapons were buying bigger calibers because they wanted the, the impact of the larger bullet. So something in forty-five caliber was the most popular, mm -hmm. 44, 45, that range. Mm -hmm. Good. This is That's still cool. in the era where you have to reach in your own pocket yeah. to acquire your weapons. And at that time, what was going on here in America? Do you know? So, like, This would have been 1870s, okay. early 1880s. Mm -hmm. So we would have been finished with the Civil War. Mm -hmm. There would have been the, the Plains Wars with the Indians mm -hmm. going on. So okay. the era of the Colt Single Action Army revolver. Mm -hmm. That's but they could have been guys rolling around with those. Exactly. Yeah, because exactly. Colt wasn't like everywhere yet, right? Or was it at that time? Uh, Colt actually manufactured in London in the early days, in the okay. cap and ball days, but that didn't last maybe a couple of years. Okay. And so when they were doing cartridge Colts, that was all done here in oh. this country. And this so, is next. a very fascinating one. This is actually the first pistol that was an issue pistol for the British government. Mm -hmm. It's the Enfield Mark II. Yeah. And it is a curious thing. It is so... It looks steampunk. ...complicated <laughs> and over-engineered. It looks, it looks it, really cool. It does. It, it yeah. has a unique look. Wow. This was also the first issue pistol for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, for all of you old enough to remember Dudley uh, Do-Right. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So this is what he they would have actually had. Exactly. Wow, that's cool, man. And like the other, it's a gate loader. 
Mm -hmm. So you'd place your cartridges one at a time in the cylinder there. Mm -hmm. But to unload it, and here's where it gets weird, mm -hmm. you would pull back on the top catch. Let me see if I can do this without my hands getting in the way. Snap it forward, wow. and the whole cylinder ran forward on a track. That's so that's so complex. Ejecting I love that. the empties, you would then shake all the empties yeah. out. But you can't reload from this position. Okay. You, you have to close that mm -hmm. and go back to the gate. Go back there to reload. So the manual of arms for that was a little complex. You have it to really was know what you're doing. Probably not the most popular pistol they yeah. ever issued. Let's get a closer cool. look at that if we can. That's it really was cool. The very first. That is cool, Sam. Oh yes, I've been wow. after one of these for quite a long time. Okay, and th so this is highly collectible. I'm assuming very, uh, very. very expensive. Can be. You, okay. you don't find them around very often. They'll appear on Gunbroker every once in a while. Okay. And the prices always get into the uncomfortable range. Right. Very nice. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Now, Webley, who's widely known for British revolvers, mm -hmm. at the same time was producing the WG model, which stood for Webley Government. Again, okay. it wasn't issued, mm -hmm. but it was very popular with officers buying their own pistols. Yeah, this looks more um, engineered, kind of like the curves and everything mm -hmm. are tighter and... It, a lot Very sleeker, specific, yeah. a lot less complicated. Yeah. Still used the um, 455 cartridge, mm -hmm. which again is slightly below the 45 ACP in velocity mm -hmm. and punching power, but it was used successfully for many decades. Mm -hmm. And this one has the classic Webley stirrup catch and the automatic ejection when you open oh. the cylinder. Kick, so big leap, your big leap in tech here. Oh yes, and you're able to reload while the weapon is open, mm -hmm. and that way things were much sped up <laughs> and a lot easier. So did they make this for a long time? They produced this for a good long while. Okay, here, if you don't mind, just, uh, yeah, so we can get a good look at this. So there would be a lot of these out there. This is more common than that Enfield revolver for some Okay, and this is a Webley... Webley government model. Webley government. Although since they printed WG on them, some people thought it meant Webley Greener. Greener was another gun maker okay. in England, but apparently that's not correct. It was Webley government. And so these if you are easier to find, and I'm assuming would be easier for still, folks to get into. Still collecting. not inexpensive or common, okay. but not, not quite as rare as the yeah. Enfield revolver. I feel like a massive leap in technology there from, from there, the There was a lot going on in those couple of decades, <laughs> yeah. you know, from the early cap and balls to the early cartridge. Yeah, very nice. Leap in um, engineering. Yeah, absolutely. Manufacturing as well, if you take if you look at it, yeah. Um, okay. And the first Webley to be government issued was the Webley Mark I, which was this revolver, again in 455 caliber. Mm -hmm. And it had the same stirrup catch opening, the same automatic ejection. So this came after that previous one right. that we looked at. Okay. This was next. This would have been late 1880s. Okay. Early 1890s. Now that that but that one looked a little bit more refined. Uh, is this just more used? Or? This was more of a production model when okay. the government was buying them directly. Oh, I and see. And starting to okay. issue them to the officers. Mm -hmm. And this variation and the marks two through five mm -hmm. stayed on until the First World War. Now, marks two through five got away from this bump this hump up at the top of the grip and went mm -hmm. to just a completely rounded grip. Okay. Much more like the old horse pistol grip. Oh, okay. And I have been told that was for use with gauntlets on for the cavalry. Oh, okay. I don't know if that's actually a fact. There's yeah. a lot of things floating around yeah. about these which... So, really and then know. why did they shorten the barrel then on that? I imagine the officers wanted something just a little handier to carry than a long barrel. Okay. Because you had this on the same belt that held your sword and other mm -hmm. equipment and it just was more ungainly the longer it was. Right. I'm guessing here. Yeah. But 
having carried guns for decades myself, <laughs> compactness yeah. has its place. So the question that jumps to mind here is obviously they would use swords and stuff like that for close combat, Certainly. right? So at what distance would they use uh, handguns? That would depend on how far the individual could accurately shoot. I mean, mm -hmm. there was there was no set range for pistol okay. combat. Okay. You you've seen a lot of illustrations of the day mm -hmm. where the fellow would have the pistol in his left hand and the sword in his right hand. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's just you know the illustrators trying to stir mm -hmm. up drama, or if they were really accurate representations, the jury's out. Okay, yeah, I just always wondered, like, I know some, sometimes they had rifles, I'm, I'm assuming they used that at the further distance, right. well, and then maybe as they closed, they went to handguns, well, and then... it was largely officers who oh, okay. had the pistols, and some oh, okay. later in First World War NCOs as well, oh, okay. but the private soldier would have his long <laughs> rifle. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it, cool. Oh, this is just an aside. During that mm -hmm. whole era, gentlemen traveling in the Empire... Mm -hmm liked to carry smaller hideout weapons. Mm -hmm. This is not military by any means, but these, this one is named the British Bulldog on the top strap. I don't mm -hmm. know if you can see that there. Yeah, bring, if you bring it a little closer, we could probably uh, get, let's see if we'll get that. Okay. Yeah. These were hugely popular both in the US as well as England. These sold massively in the American West as hideout guns. Mm -hmm. They were a gate loader, like the earlier ones mm -hmm. that we examined, mm -hmm. like a Colt single action, and they had that swing out ejection rod to punch out the empties. Mm -hmm. You may remember this little one. It's was, a movie gun. That's right. This was the one that Chris Pratt used in the card trick scene during the Magnificent Seven. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. You're the only guy I know that has an actual, no, actually, I, I might know one other dude that has a movie gun, <laughs> but that is really cool. Well, the 450 Adams that this was chambered for has not been made in a hundred years or more, <laughs> but they found on the set that a 44 Russian blank would work That's in it, it. so oh. that was what they used for the scene. That's a cool gun. So are these are these expensive? Are these difficult to find examples of now? Or? Again, these very often will show up in places like gun broker or antique mm -hmm. weapon sites. Mm -hmm. They're they're not inexpensive. But they don't run as much as some of the rarer, more oddball. Okay. Guns. Makes sense. That's a cool gun, man. Now we're up to the First World War era. Okay. Right. And that's when Webley went to their big Mark VI, which is what most people think of for Webley revolvers. It has the square frame grip, the longer six inch barrel. This one has the same stirrup opening and hinged action. That's a, yeah, that's a big gun. And it's got. Yes, this is oh, this man. is a reproduction of okay. the of the Pritchard Webley bayonet made mm -hmm. for trench fighting, mm -hmm. which was one of those ideas that never really took off. <laughs> really, you know, the the I fella love that. <laughs> that looks so you know so mean. <laughs> it, it does look good, but apparently it wasn't all yeah. that practical yeah. in actual. Can use. you hold it sideways so we can get a look Certainly. at it here? Yeah, it looks a lot beefier, a lot more butch. Yeah, they, they bulked up the revolver, they changed the grip frame, which made it much easier to point and shoot. Mm -hmm. Kept the same action, single action, double action, same four, five, five cartridge. Mm -hmm. Is that brass uh, for the bayonet? Yes, yeah. it's a brass hilt. And okay. apparently they had a pile of old French gras bayonets mm -hmm. at whatever company was making these. Mm -hmm. So they just chopped down the old rifle bayonets and used the blades from those. Oh. So Since does that does that bayonet does it come separate does it separate from that and yes, then that there's works a, as a handle? A catch here okay. to get it past the sight, but it, mm -hmm. it's a little tricky and tight to get mm -hmm. on and off. Oh okay. Again, this one is a reproduction. There were very few of the originals made at the time. They weren't a successful seller. Okay. So if you ever find an original with provenance, that's going to get into the silly category right. of cost. And if the, if they don't want it or something like that, they could always call you up and you'd be able to, <laughs> we, we have to give, it a, <laughs> give it a good home. <laughs> so, and are the reproductions of those pretty valuable too? They're not too terrible. Um, okay. International Military Antiques has these. Oh, okay. And they, they're very good quality reproductions. Yeah, that's cool. I think I've seen that in your collection before. Then in World War II, while they did still have a great many of the 455s, which you used because they were using 
every and anything. They switched to the 38 caliber short, the basic 38 Smith & Wesson, mm -hmm. which the British refer to as a 380, not to be confused with the automatic cartridge. It's a rimmed cartridge. Mm -hmm. But they went to the smaller, lighter pistol in the smaller caliber, same stirrup arrangement. Enfield made these revolvers, although it was still a Webley design. Oh, okay. This one is the double action only. They did make ones with the spur for caulking as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been a big fan of the 38 short. It's a fairly anemic cartridge, but they were easier to train people with than the larger cartridge, and I suppose it helped the logistics. You didn't have as much material involved. Mm -hmm. But when you when you look at this as a collector, does the caliber um, positively or negatively affect you? Because I'm just wondering, does that make it more rare or unique, th those calibers, even though they were kind of weak? Or do you look at it like from a tactical point of view, like, ah, that was, that was, <laughs> so I don't really want to collect that. That didn't do any kind of damage. Well, no, I'm, I'm interested in collecting all the things that were in common use oh, okay. throughout the history. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't be what I would personally choose to carry because I think a bigger bullet is better. Mm -hmm. But this was the issue for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the automatic. Uh, so we go so to the Browning High Power, mm -hmm. which these were made by Inglis in Canada. This is an original Chinese contract English. Mm -hmm. The Chinese contracted for a large number of guns. Only a few thousand got delivered before they basically collapsed. Okay. And they couldn't take delivery of the rest, so the Commonwealth forces, Canada, England, mm -hmm. Aussies, they took the rest of them. Okay. If it has a C in the, CH actually, in the serial number, mm -hmm. it's a Chinese contract. Oh, okay. This one, you can't really see it, has the crossed flags of the Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's in great shape because it's probably carried a lot more than it was shot, mm -hmm. since it's a young Signal Corps officer, which is mm -hmm. not running out in the front with a bayonet yelling charge. These also had the tangent sights for mm -hmm. long range use. That's almost, that's like an AK kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, because they made the shoulder stock holster mm -hmm. and these had the cut in the back of the grip mm -hmm. to put these on, like with the broom handle Mauser, uh. and you create a so small is this, carbine. So does this predate the Mauser? No, this is the 1935 okay. Browning. The Mauser was 1890s, oh, okay. 96. Okay. And this is an original stock. You can't really see it there, but it is dated 1945, punched into the wood. Okay. And that's important because as we discussed with the broom handle Mauser, mm -hmm. using the actual original antique stock, mm -hmm. it doesn't come under the NFA for short barrel Oh, rifle. right, right. Yeah, I was gonna say, nowadays you can't do this, but in that yeah. time, this was yeah. common practice? Right. Okay. You couldn't put a reproduction stock on this and be within the law from my understanding. Right. I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I've heard it from a number of authoritative sources. Right. But well, we know for sure the ATF doesn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go there. So, That's um, very nice. So this is about the end mm -hmm. of the Empire period. By mm -hmm. this time, in the late 40s, early 50s, the former colonies are all becoming self-governing. Mm -hmm. England is withdrawing to its own island and a few little outposts like the Bahamas and such. Mm -hmm. And that sort of brings the Empire to its close. Oh, okay. So what was it? What was interesting here that we just talked about is you were, you were saying how this was manufactured by China. Was that no, no, no for China? For oh, right. so this was made f for yeah, China. These were manufactured by Inglis in Canada, the same company that made the Brand like machine gun. Oh, okay. And then they then they went to China. So they they were contracted by the Chinese, but they collapsed before they could take more than a few thousand in delivery. Oh, I see. 
And so okay. the rest of them just got rerouted to Commonwealth use. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah, I was going to ask whether or not China was manufacturing things back then for people or not. It was kind of going the other way around in those days. Not then. to my knowledge, yeah. although mm -hmm. the, uh, the Chinese had a huge number of broom handle Mausers mm -hmm. from earlier on, mm -hmm. and they did take delivery of some of the high powers. Oh, okay. But... You would have to delve into the actual history to get more detail on that. Yeah, it'll be it'll just be interesting to see where did China stop uh, having things made outside and start manufacturing things. I'm themselves. not sure how much they actually manufactured in country. Yeah, and you'd have to look yeah. that up. Yeah, that's interesting. Very very cool. Um, I, how many years did it take you to put all of these? Th things oh, together here I've with these been, guns. I've been collecting the Empire period weapons since my late 20s. Mm -hmm. So decades of gathering things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's now fairly complete. I mean, there's a few holes in the collection I wouldn't <laughs> mind filling, but those are expensive yeah, holes. Yeah, there's still time. <laughs> they, they may take a while. Yeah, you never know. Very nice, Sam. Thanks a lot. I really, I really appreciated taking a look at that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this as well. I'm sure there's going to be some people out there that know uh, some details. Oh, and I'm sure, like that, and I, know, I may have misstated some part of the yeah. history, so... It's all good. That's I'm, the fun I'm of YouTube. I'm open to correction. Yes, that's the fun of YouTube. You guys can leave your comments. Um, let us know if you have some of these things, if you collect this kind of stuff, if you're interested in it. Maybe you have some of the gaps in here that Sam's <laughs> looking for. You know? I don't know. You might barter some holsters maybe for... Perfectly you know. willing to do Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Big thanks to Sam Andrews of Andrews Custom Leather. Um, do you, you you make holsters for this kind of stuff? Or I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know if I you have, do it for the flintlock stuff. No, I, I have yeah. in the past made mm -hmm. a, a Webley holster or two for people. Yeah. But those were special custom things. And mm -hmm. It doesn't really come up. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing nowadays people are just collecting these more Largely. than yeah than act, put, actually put it. There's some there's some guys out there that would take these old school things, man, and put them into use these days. Oh, absolutely. Not, yeah. Most of these are still in shooting condition. Yeah. I went somewhere the other day, and there was a there was a kid that had a broom uh, a, a broom handle Mauser on his hip, yeah. and I was like, "There you go, that's points for style." Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, guys, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave your comments. We'll get Sam to uh, come in here and uh, check those out, respond to a couple of those, mm -hmm. uh, as well as ring the bell so you can be notified every time we post a video. Big thanks to Lola on the camera, um, and we'll see you guys next time. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.